speaker is from Montgomery, Alabama. She grew up a block and a half down the street from Martin Luther King. She lived the civil rights movement. In her younger years, she attended various schools from Montgomery County School to Southern Normal High School. In her college years, she was going to Tuskegee Institute to be a re registered nurse. But as she, I guess, progressed in life, <laughs> she was inspired. Well, she wanted to, I guess, uh, it's kind of hard speaking, but. Guess, You're doing, doing fine. fine. You're doing fine. I guess she became interested in games and two, 20 story buildings. So she changed her major from being a registered nurse to the School of Arts and Science. She wanted to change the world as a social worker. At Georgia State University in 1970, she was a member of the first class to graduate with university status. She received her JD, or Doctor of Law degree, from Emory University. She had 18 months as a social worker with the Georgia Department of Education, of, of Education and Vocational Rehabilitation. She was four years as a con contract administrator and attorney for the MARTA, Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. Miss Merritt was widowed in 2005. <laughs> she has three kids, Katrina, Hope Merritt III, and Holly Madison Merritt. Please join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Miss Attorney Normarine Colbert Merritt. Well, good morning, my sisters. Good morning. And, and my brother. Thank you. favored by God, will give birth to a son, and even tells her what to name the child. Having never had sex, the young girl is puzzled. And so she inquires of the messenger as to how this conception is to take place. The messenger responds that the Holy Spirit will cause it to happen. In this society, being single and pregnant could be disastrous. Unless the father of the child agreed to marry you, you would probably be single for the rest of your life. And if the expectant mother's natural father then rejected her, her only alternative was begging or prostitution. You see, she couldn't just go and look for a job, for this was an agrarian or farming society, and everybody worked for the family. Besides, what would people, especially her fiance, say about this pregnancy that's caused by the Holy Spirit? You know how they probably were. Oh, huh. You know, the last time I heard, <laughs> one man plus one woman equals one child. 
I bet you if you get the DNA, you'll find there's a man in there somewhere. Quite a dilemma, wouldn't you say? So how did Mary respond? She said to the messenger, let it be to me as you have said. Mary answered, yes, Lord. She and her fiance, who had received a separate visit from this angelic being, advising of the true fatherhood of the child, Mary. <coughs> Mary later delivered this child, who was fathered by the Holy Spirit, in a stable or barn where animals are kept during the night. And she placed him in a manger or trough or box where animals ate. To protect the life of this child, Mary, Joseph, and the child had to escape like thieves in the night. Yet, Mary nurtured the child, and he grew. Now, we have a lot of mothers in here, and we've been sitting telling some of our war stories. But you, have you ever thought that with Mary, there are only two recorded in instances where she could say, hmm, I'm his mother. One was when her son Jesus was 12, and she found him sitting in the temple talking to the scholars. The other <coughs> instance was when he made some very good wine at a wedding ceremony. Otherwise, history records that Jesus, Mary's son, was despised by his contemporaries, abandoned by his closest friend, tortured, and killed by means reserved for the most heinous of criminals. And the messenger told her, that she was highly favored. Seek, serve, and stand. Hundreds of years later in Wayne County, Mississippi, United States of America, a little colored girl named <coughs> Osceola McCarty was born. It was March 7th, 1908. And young people, this was well before the Civil Rights Movement. In fact, we African Americans had not yet even gotten to the point that we were referred to as Negroes. Osceola's father died when she was a little girl. Her mother moved to Hattiesburg, Mississippi and worked hard to support her child sometimes having to leave her alone. <coughs> Osceola McCarty later remarked that she would be afraid and vowed that she would save money when she could so that she could take care of her grandmother. Osceola would iron clothes after coming home from Eureka Elementary School. Her formal education ended after sixth grade when she began taking care of a childless aunt who had become ill and paralyzed. She continued to dream of an education. For the next 75 years, she toiled washing and ironing clothes of some of Hattiesburg's leading families serving three generations of some of them. At least in the beginning, she used Tide, a tub, and a washerboard. And I know that you young people don't know what a washerboard, <laughs> but you know my grandmother called it a rub board. And it was a rich thing. And you, we, there were no washing machines. And you took the clothes and you rubbed them over the washing board 
until they were cleaner than many of the clothes that come out of the automatic washing. <laughs> And you hung the clothes on the line to dry, and the sun further bleached them. She ironed and folded them. At first, she made between a dollar fifty cent and two dollars a bundle. When she started making ten dollars a bundle, she doesn't remember when. She just knows it was after World War II. <coughs> She started saving. <clears throat> From a small, simple wood frame house on a dusty road, given to her in 1947 by her uncle, she laundered clothes until December 1994, when she was forced to retire at the age of 86, her hands gnarled by arthritis. Never married, never owned a car. She walked everywhere, including to the grocery store, pushing a car one mile each way. In 1995, one year after her retirement, she gave $150,000 to the University of Southern Mississippi, where had she had the means, she could not have attended until September 1965, when she was 57 years old. That was when the first blacks were admitted to the institution. Her contribution endowed a scholarship for African Americans students, which has now grown to over uh, 600,000. The $150,000 that she gave to the University of Mississippi constituted three-fifths of her funds at the time. Ms. McCarty had saved $250,000 or accumulated $250,000 through savings, a couple of small inheritances, one from her aunt and one from her mother, and investments made by her bankers in certificates of deposits and conservative mutual funds. Osceola McCarty, shy, quiet, God-fearing, plain, common, obscure, only left Mississippi one time in 87 years. At the time that she made the contribution to the University of Southern Mississippi, she had only left the state one time. Osceola McCarty received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Harvard University. She is the author of a 112-page book, Simple Wisdom for rich, rich Living, and she took a computer class at the age of 87. She has received numerous recognitions all over the world. As a matter of fact, she carried an Olympic torch when the games were here in Georgia. And she visited with the uh, President and Mrs. Clinton in the White House, has been, uh, had been um, honored by the Congressional Black Caucus and anybody who is anybody. died at the age of 91, four years after she gave the money to the school. Seek, serve, and stand. 46 years after Dr. Osceola McCarty was born, Oprah Gail Winfrey 
came on the scene in another Mississippi town, Kosciuszko. She was born to unmarried teenage parents, Vernita Lee, a housemaid, and Vernon Winfrey in the armed forces at the time of her birth, but who toiled as a coal miner, a barber, and later became a city councilman. Oprah's mother moved north, so Oprah spent the first six years of her life living with her grandmother in rural poverty. Grandma Hattie May, adults in here, taught Winfrey to read at the age of three. Took a switch to her when she disobeyed or failed to do her chores and took her to church where Oprah was nicknamed Preacher for all of the Bible verses that she could recite by heart. At age six, Oprah went to live with her mother in an inner city ghetto of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She had a challenging home life. Despite it, she skipped two of her earliest grades and received a scholarship to attend Nicolette High School in the Glendale suburb of Milwaukee. She could not afford the things and activities of her better off classmates. She rebelled, ran, ran away from home, and ran the streets. A self-described promiscuous teenager Oprah became pregnant at age 14, giving birth to a son who later died before leaving the hospital. Frustrated, her mother, Renita, sent Oprah to live with her father, Vernon, in Nashville, Tennessee. He was strict and stressed education. Oprah became an honor student joined the high school speech team, placed second in the nation in a dramatic interpretation, and won an oratory contest that secured her a full scholarship to historically black Tennessee State University, where she studied, guess what, <laughs> communication. <laughs> Oprah worked at a local radio station while in college, and the rest is history. Oprah Gail Winfrey is the multiple Emmy Award winning host of the Oprah Winfrey Show, the highest rated talk show in television history. Talk about black women. Her influence as a book critic is called the Oprah Effect. When she introduces a book as her book club selection, it instantly becomes a bestseller. An Academy Award nominated actress, publisher of two magazines, O and O at Home, co-author of five books, and co-founder of Women's Cable Television Network. Y'all know Oxygen. <laughs> In September 2006, Oprah and Friends Channel began broadcasting 24-7 on XM Satellite Radio. This was a 55 million three-year deal for Oprah. Oh, she's wealthy. She's wealthy. She has a lot of, what you call it, Alice? Bling bling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A millionaire at age 32. A net worth of $340 million at age 41. She has been on the Forbes 400 list, which includes America's 400 richest people, for the past three years. Worth over $1.5 billion, Forbes recognizes Oprah as the richest self-made woman in America, bypassing the president of eBay. 
Oprah Winfrey gives back. Oprah's Angel Network, a charity for which she personally covers all administrative costs so that 100% of the funds raised go to the charitable programs, encourages people around the world to make a difference in the lives of the underprivileged others. The network has raised more than $51 million. In addition, Oprah has personally given over $303 million to charity. She gave $10 million to the Hurricane Katrina relief. And she sent 100 black men to college with seven million in scholarships. In 2005, Business Week listed her among the 50 most generous philanthropists, she being number 32. And she looks like us. In 2004, Oprah donated and personally delivered seven million in gifts to children in South Africa affected by poverty and AIDS. And we have all heard of her latest contribution, the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy, in which she invested 40 million of her own money and time. It opened this past January with an enrollment of 152, but will gradually accommodate 450. No wonder so many rank Oprah Winfrey as the world's most influential woman. Seek, serve, and stand. Seek as the three women that I just brought to you did. Search for your calling in life. I wish that I could tell you a magic formula for doing it. I can't, but I can give you some thoughts on it. One, Go to your maker. Always commune with him about his plan for your life, your purpose for being here. I'm sure that Dr. Osceola McCarty did not think that perhaps her calling was to wash and iron. And I know Mary, the mother of Jesus, didn't think that she would have to watch her firstborn son suffer as she did. So the first thing you got to do is check with your maker. For you are here for a purpose. And the beautiful thing about Dr. McCarty is she stated that, that she knew that she had to work harder than other people. But that didn't make her feel sad because she knew that she could depend on God. And even after she had to retire, she stated that she would work if she could. She loved to work. The <coughs> next thing, I'm gonna tell you something you don't do. Do not choose a career based on money. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, if you've got to do it for eight hours a day, at least enjoy it. Make sure that it is something that you enjoy. And here I'm going to allude to my daughter who's here with me, um, who um, 
was an excellent student, is a Harvard graduate, and has a couple of masters, and I think um, her first job out of Harvard was with IBM, and she was actually miserable. <laughs> she volunteered with, I think, Hands On Atlanta, and um, ended up going back, and getting her masters of teaching, and she teaches English in the International Baccalaureate Program in the metropolitan area. And mm -hmm. she is absolutely happy. She enjoys it. And I love listening to her talk about her students. Now, I knew that teaching was her calling. As a matter of fact, I come from a line of educators myself. And I knew that because I had watched her. but. I let her go where she thought she was supposed to go because she was a certain kind of student. Adults, for your natural children and all of the children, like Hope Oprah's 152, because, you know, as black folks, we're everybody's mother. I know that people would see me walking and they didn't like the way I walk. Before I could get home, they tell my mama I was switching. <laughs> <laughs> when I got home. But you know, we, we often look and we think about the proverb that says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That doesn't mean beat the daylights out of us. Okay? It doesn't mean to, to, to be constantly disciplined them, whether physically or otherwise. What that proverb means is that you're supposed to watch a child and see how that child leans. And you're supposed to develop those leans. That's how you train a child up in the way he should go. The thing about Oprah that I love that her grandmother said is that ever since she's been in the world, she's been on stage. Her grandmother said that she used to interview corn cob dolls and crows <laughs> on the fence of the family farm. <laughs> so now we know why Oprah is a billionaire. Oprah is in her milieu, her environment. And another thing I say um, young, to the young people particularly, don't let anybody tell you because you speak the king's English correctly or that you dress ladies when you leave something to the imagination <laughs> and where you will only date guys who know where their waist is <laughs> and can put a belt in their pants and you know there's nothing wrong with a belt and when you shirt inside. That's right. And don't let anybody tell you because you're good, because you're smart, because you work hard, that you act in white. Mm -hmm. Because there is nothing that any of the people in my background saw white about me going out and representing them. As a matter of fact, when you walked out the door, they tell you, remember. Remember who you are. That's right. So when you act quote, right, it does not mean you're acting white. Mm -hmm. And if there are people who tell you that, then you tell them, you, you, you know, they'll look at you and you'll be down the road and they'll still be back here talking about acting white. That's right. That's right. The other thing, if you notice, Oprah read. She was reading at the break. And through her book club, she has stimulated many people to read who would be couch potatoes otherwise, and probably don't read, except for the, the books on Oprah's <laughs> And when you read, if you can't use a word in a sentence comfortably, don't say, well, I kind of think it means this, or I can get it from the context. It's all right to do that if you can't get to a dictionary. Mm -hmm. But if you can get to a dictionary, look it up. Mm -hmm. Use another mm -hmm. sentence. Add a word to your vocabulary every day. I give you a good, good one that came up with, with me recently. 
And uh, well, for one thing, I, I want to share with you, I was over at my daughter's house, and she has three children, and uh, my little angels. But my oldest um, grandchild, grandson, who's seven, uh, when I was over at the house recently, he told his mama, he says, they call me Deary. Um, so Deary had a dictionary. And so he seemed to have been fascinated. But I do, whether I'm reading the newspaper, a novel, textbook, or what. Whatever it is is in one hand and my dictionary is within reach. And I do that at my age with my educational background. Just think about it, wouldn't it be good, you know, when you think about Imus, you know, everybody was all upset about what Imus said. And Imus did, he offended blacks, even though the team was not totally black, the basketball team. And he offended womanhood. So, you know, wouldn't it be good, you know, have you ever thought about getting somebody told and they don't really realize you're getting them told? <laughs> So the next time somebody says something to you about Imus, you tell them, yes, he's a misogynist. Mm. Now go home and look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Seek, serve, and stand. Once you know what your calling is, and, and let me back up, it's okay. If, 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 you, if, 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 if it's not a direct line, it's, it, it, it's okay. You know, we've got to learn to allow people to grow. And you don't grow by everything falling in place. Some of my best lessons have come when I made a mistake. You know, in 10th grade biology, and I was a good student, in 10th grade biology, we once had a pop quiz with 10 questions on it. And one of the questions was moon, man, and altar. And I thought, and I thought, and I went over my notes and everything. I missed that question on the test. And I should have known the answer. But do you know that is the, those are, that, those were the authors of my 10th grade biology book. And that's the only authors that I remember from high school. <laughs> and it was because I missed those authors on that 10th grade test and I just kept moon, man, <laughs> and author. I don't know what else they did, but they wrote my 10th grade biology book. <laughs> Once you know your calling, though, work hard at it. Did y'all see how Dr. Ossie, I love calling her Dr. McCarty. Mm -hmm. Sixth grade education. I love the way she ironed with a purpose, and that's what she said. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, do it well. My grandmother used to have a little poem that she, I used to say, if a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be the labor, great or small. Do it well or not at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell y'all, I, I really do that. Because recently when I was running for office, I, 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 I fell and I broke my elbow. And my arm is never going to be right. But I did it totally. I <laughs> fractured it in two places. I chilled part of it all. And I dislocated it. And I told people, I can't even half hurt myself. <laughs> my grandma told me that. And so you, you work for excellence. And if you work and think about it, if you're working at something you enjoy, it is easy to work toward excellence. If you work for something that's going to make you a lot of money, you think, then it's highly unlikely you will be successful anyway. And adults with this, we really need to, to, to watch our children. And I mean that in a global sense. Of my three children, none of them are anything alike. Anything alike. 
Uh, my middle child, who's a son, is uh, getting his MBA um, next month. And he struggles with reading. But now you give him some engineering, and I can't understand what he's saying. So what if I had become frustrated and his father had become frustrated because he wasn't like Kim, who could devour anything in reading and was always off with the chart in verbal. And then I take my third child, who I call my artist, and she just kind of, um, you know, she just, she wasn't like either of them. <coughs> she didn't know what she wanted to be even when she went to college. She's still trying to find out. <laughs> anyway, do what you are, what your calling is well. And then finally, stand. No matter what you do, you're going to have some difficult times. Oprah Winfrey, first of all, she had a child at a very young age. Secondly, she went through some horrendous, as I was reading about her bad choices in men before she got with Stedman, I was just flabbergasted. I thought Stedman had been around the whole while. <laughs> but she had some horrible choices. She even talked about her hair falling out when she was working, because uh, she got a bad perm, and, 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 and particularly her weight, which she related to the fact that she had poor self-esteem. And so, and even now, I think unjustifiably, have y'all heard the talk about how Oprah shouldn't have spent $40 million on the Academy in South Africa? Well, the people talking first need to get $40 million so they can make it. <laughs> and then they can spend their $40 million however they want to. That's exactly right. You know, Oprah is giving back. And she gives back where her God tells her. So, but you know what? Oprah went right on and she got the fine china and what is it, the 400 count sheets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for her orphan girls that she called. Mm -hmm. So you can't let a, 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 a disappointment or difficulty or somebody, because people will forever criticize. I mean, how anybody could think of anything with Oprah doing that? then my God, what can I do, is beyond me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my sisters and brother, seek, serve, and stay.